All right. Well, we are at eight o'clock. So welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Um, this warm and kind of gray uh, October day. Um, and we're delighted to have uh, one of our own junior faculty from the Division of Cardiology. And to introduce Michael, uh, Dr. Mohammed Hamdan, our Division Chief of uh, Cardiovascular Medicine. Mohammed. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Michael Akaviri. Dr. Akaviri went to medical school at Tulane University in New Orleans. He did his residency in internal medicine at Rush University, and he did his fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center in Chicago. He joined our faculty only two years ago in 2021 as a clinical assistant professor. Dr. Akaviri is board certified in internal medicine and cardiovascular medicine. He's also a diplomat of the National Board of Echocardiography and has a board certification in nuclear cardiology and cardiac CT. In addition to being an outstanding clinician, Dr. Akavidi has always had passion and interest in medical ethics. Before going to medical school, he completed a master's degree in philosophy from Vanderbilt University, and the focus of his thesis was medical ethics. During medical school, he was a member of the Tulane University School of Medicine Ethics Committee, and during his fellowship, he was the co-chair of the Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center Residence Forum and was also a member of the Ethics Committee. So soon after joining our division, Dr. Akaviri gave a cardiovascular medicine grand round on the topic of ethics in medicine, and everyone was impressed, and we thought he should share that uh, presentation with our department. So I'm delighted that he was selected to give medicine grand rounds, and the topic of his presentation today is feeling better, consideration of the implied ethics of symptom-centric therapy. Dr. Akaviri. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamden. That was a really kind introduction. Thank you so much to Dr. Schnapp and to the department um, for letting me do this. It's an honor and a pleasure and, and so many great things um, to be able to, to be here today. Um, so I am gonna talk about um, kind of ethics. I'm gonna talk about uh, what we do. I'm gonna talk about how we think about what we do um, and kind of also about maybe what patients think about uh, what we do. In terms of, in terms of disclosures, uh, I have no particular uh, disclosures here, and uh, not just um, because I don't have any financial disclosures, but also because we're not really gonna be talking about any particular therapies or medicines. What we're gonna be talking about is how our personal kind of ethics or personal uh, philosophy is going to interact with what we think we're really doing. And so what I'd like for us to, for you to be thinking about as I'm going through this, um, what I'd like for you to reflect upon later in the day is to think about where your own personal philosophy comes from. Is it a cultural piece? Is it a religious piece? Is it a combination? Is it because of deep uh, kind of other study that you've made? How that belief system then interfaces with this professional ethics that we all practice kind of within this kind of structure. And then how you talk to patients about things that make them feel better and potentially how that might intersect with how you view um, what it is to feel better or what it is to do a good thing. And I'll give you a little bit of background to this story that I hope uh, makes all of those pieces fit together a little better. As Dr. Hamden said, uh, I did my training in Chicago, and the patient population there, besides being uh, demographically very different than here, was very different in that it seemed like they had they had to do physical activity in a different way. A lot of my patients had to use public transportation, so maybe they would tell me, uh, you know, I have a symptom, I get chest pain or short of breath when I walk two blocks to the bus, or I'm fine, but if I have to hurry to the bus, that's when it happens. Even if they had a vehicle there would often be kind of an impracticality to using it for short travel. So if they had a nephew that lived down the street or a pharmacy that was around the corner, they just seemed to have to do more activity. And in practice, that made taking care of them a little bit easier. I both had a greater sense of when they didn't actually encounter a symptom. And I also had a better sense of what I was really doing to improve their symptom or improve their life. So I could say, well, if you get short of breath when you finally get to your nephews and you have to climb the stairs, you know, that's what we're really going to target. That's what we're going to hope to see, you know, improve. And, you know, that's something I can quantify. One flight of stairs, two standard Chicago city blocks. Coming here to Madison, which is my, you know, my first real 
uh, job, the population is different. There are more uh, suburban um, patients, even in my Madison clinic. And then as a big part of what our division does, we do regional work. And my clinics are in Richland Center uh, and in Darlington. And I have patients that live in those small towns or even kind of more rural communities outside of there. And I started to really struggle with not the um, assessment of the pathology that people were experiencing, though that, that was its own kind of different uh, problem, but also kind of what to tell them I may be able to improve for them in terms of why they came to the office that day. So for example, I may have a patient who um, doesn't really experience much shortness of breath, but they get short of breath when they walk up the big hill at the end of the street, right? How big is that hill? How fast are you trying to walk up that hill? I, I don't really know what the level of pathology, you know, I can expect from this kind of non-standard description. Or maybe they got uh, some chest pain when they walked all the way to the back of Menards two months ago, right? You may say, how often do you do that? And they say, I don't know, maybe a couple times a year, right? And it hasn't happened since and it happened that one time. I'm going to put you through, you know, maybe some tests or maybe there'd be some kind of therapy here you'd have to receive. What is the net benefit that you're going to really get to, to take away from this? And I started to struggle with, with what to do um, with these patients. And a lot of it has to do with this uh, framework that uh, I certainly was taught this, this um, phrase that comes up a lot in cardiology, I'm sure in other branches too, that we have this dual mandate as physicians, right? In a practical way, we make patients live longer or make them feel better. And if you have something that you're going to do for them, it's got to do one of the two. And if it doesn't do it, you shouldn't be doing it. And I think for things like living longer, that's straightforward enough. It certainly has its own whole world of kind of uh, ethical questions and concepts that are really important to it, but there's a, a goal there that is understandable. Now, sometimes we make patients feel worse in terms of trying to make them live longer, right? So we take on something that we know will make them feel worse, but live longer is a more you know, a noble goal. And so that's worth it. And we, again, assume that it's worth it to the patient as well. Isn't always, um, but that's kind of part of the, the construct. But feeling better is a whole different side of the coin, because when it comes to feeling better, how, how am I supposed to judge really what it is? Now, when we do it, we know it works, right? So when patients come in, they go, I feel better, right? You know, that's great. You know, now I really know after the fact. But beforehand, it's a little bit challenging because you really have to know what it is about that patient that makes them feel good, right? What is a good day for that patient? What do they want to do in a, in a good day? Um, and in terms of this, this concept of good, it's really a deeply philosophical type of question, right? There are some kinds of things that we would just assume would be good for all people, like being able to walk further without getting short of breath would be a net good. But there's also kind of a cost balance to that. Does the patient really want to be able to go for a long walk? Is that something the patient really wants? Is that something that they're gonna be willing to accept something else that's not good on the other side of the balance in order to, to kind of accept a different uh, you know, net good that we wanna give them? And this good idea, as I said, it's this deeply philosophical question. And that's how a lot of us are introduced to philosophy in the first place. Well, what is good? What's a good action? what is uh, good morally, but it's much deeper than that. Good has a whole bunch of applications. Like what is good art? That's not really an ethical question, right? Um, you may say this painting is beautiful. I think that's good. Someone else may say, I've seen a painting like that. It's derivative, it's not good, right? Derivative art isn't good to them. Well, that's, that's you know not true for everybody, right? So there's something deeper that underlies all of these opinions that we have. What makes for a good day? What makes for a good art? What makes for a good outcome? And that comes along with all of our kind of internal um, philosophical baggage that for all of us comes from a really different place. And it's gonna come from a different place for us than it's certainly gonna come for our patients. And so I know some of you may be saying after that probably may say, look, you're overthinking it, right? Like, as you already said, when patients feel better, you know it, they tell you they feel better. We study this, I'm a scientist. I do a trial, the patient feels better afterward, and then like, I know I can use that, right? So when I say I make patients feel better, I do what the data says. And to be honest with you, that's the first place I turned when this came up after I uh, relocated here. I started to look at the data and I said, what's the data telling me about what I can tell these patients? So if I'm gonna sign you up for 
getting this medicine or getting this procedure, and it's going to come with frequent blood tests or maybe some side effects, or you just don't really like to take the medicine, right? But I'm going to be able to tell you, you're going to get X or Y out of it. And so I did this. And we're going to take kind of a deep dive into some cardiology literature, but it's it's really about the inner workings uh, of, of the, the study. So in this case, we're going to talk about a parallel trial to the ischemia trial. So ischemia, for those of you who are unfamiliar, very important study for cardiology in the last few years. It was a longitudinal study that took patients who had established ischemic disease. So these are the much feared abnormal stress tests. They had abnormal stress tests and they randomized patients to either getting an invasive therapy or conservative medical therapy. And this is the kind of live longer mandate, right? Are we making these patients live longer based on these two choices? And not to get into the inner kind of criticisms of the trial, but the headline result here was that we didn't see significant difference between these two. And so there wasn't going to be a kind of live longer mandate, again, kind of from the top line result that was going to steer patients in one of these two directions. But they did a companion trial that ran parallel to it. And this was this health status outcomes trial run by the same group, same group of patients. But this answered the other question of our mandate, the feel better portion. And I think that for a lot of people who practice cardiology or anyone who's ever known anyone who got a, a PCI or a STEM, stents make patients feel better, right? I mean, there's something really intuitive about it. They have all kinds of discomfort and then they get it. Physiologically, it makes so much sense. Like you open up the blockage. Obviously, it comes with um, you know, risks of, of stent uh, complications, but we know that it has this you know, defined benefit. But in terms of what we do when we're really practicing and saying, well, I'm a scientist, right? I'm, I'm showing you the data, the research of it. We got to prove it. And so they, they tried to do it with this trial. And the trial used several assessments to see what it is to make the patient feel better. They used this thing called the Seattle Angina Questionnaire, which we're going to dive really deep into. This thing called the Rose Dyspnea Scale, again, assuming having less dyspnea, that's good, right? That's a good outcome. So we measure that. And then a separate uh, scale just to look at quality of life. And trying to grade angina, like for the sake of that this trial is going to do, this has been something people have been trying to do for a relatively long time for research purposes. This is a letter to the editor of Circulation in 1972. Uh, this is coming from uh, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, whose angina scale ended up being used uh, pretty extensively, talking about how they are, are modeling this uh, scale off of the NYHA uh, heart failure uh, structure. And you can see here on the side, it's really not very finely graded, right? So um, patients can walk two blocks on the level or climbing more than a flight of ordinary stairs at a normal pace and in normal conditions. Maybe that's kind of easy for me to assess in Chicago. Two city blocks, eight blocks in a mile. In Chicago, I know exactly what that is. It's a grid. Here, I don't really know what it is to climb that big hill at the end of the street. I don't really know how far it is to the deli counter and the back of the grocery store that's making patients experience this. So grading their angina is going to be challenging. And again, if I'm trying to act true to the data, I'm going to have to be able to tell them, well, if you have grade one angina or, you know, three angina, I'm going to get you to a two, or I'm going to get you from a two to a one. There's a lot of uh, kind of stuff that I have to do to interpret that. And a lot of understanding the patient has to have of standard uh, measurements and ideas. So they tried to improve on this. And a big uh, change was the creation of this Seattle angina questionnaire, which happened in 1992. Uh, they did a couple of trials to kind of validate it uh, in the early 90s. And this used 19 different questions to try and get at how bad someone's angina was. Here, this is a, a series of questions I have just about when patients would experience angina. And you'll see, this is a big range of activities, right? Dressing yourself all the way to things like swimming or tennis, running or jogging, which I would say, you know, a significant number of our patients, you know, aren't, aren't all that far along on this kind of activity scale, but you get a lot of gradation out of here. But for those of you who study, you know, the formation of surveys, this is actually a really repetitive question. So if you're getting kind of a, a point for each one of these, if you already have chest pain when dressing yourself, you know, it's going to also affect you when you walk indoors or when you're showering or when you climb a flight of stairs. And so there's a little bit of heavy weighting that's going to occur around this portion of the survey. The other thing about the survey is it includes some other questions that really aren't about the angina itself at all. 
like question number six of, of these 19, how satisfied are you that everything possible is being done to treat your chest pain? That almost seems more like a quality of life type of question. It certainly doesn't seem like a question about the angina itself, but it does seem like a really good question to ask if I'm, we're doing a good job for the patient because the patient may only have angina when they run or jog, but they may really feel a lot of psychological distress from the experience of the angina. So it's hard to weigh. When I'm doing this you know, uh, questionnaire, am I finding out how much angina they have? Am I finding how bothersome it is to them? Are those always the same thing? Furthermore, question number 11, uh, which we'll, I'll kind of talk about again at the end, how often do you worry that you may have a heart attack or die suddenly? That's very scary. And I would say that if you have patients who know that they are receiving one type of therapy when there may be another kind of therapy that's out there, there's kind of this question that hangs over people's heads. And again, this is not always dependent really on the degree of angina they're having, right? You may have patients have angina every week and they're not that worried about it. And you may have a patient who had that angina that one time and they get a cath and it's normal and they're still worried about it, right? They're not, they're not even gonna take this survey, but you know, there are patients who are definitely still worried about that all the time. So they came up with this survey and then they had to validate it. And the way in which they validated this survey was to do something that makes so much sense, right? So you have a survey, you're gonna give it to people of angina, and then I need to see if the score changes. Well, what gets rid of angina? Give them a PCI. We know it works, right? we do it all the time. And that's what they did. And so you can see here, they took these patients, they gave them the, the score, that's the, the darker of the bars. Then in the lighter bar, uh, you know, you see these kind of, oh, sorry, the, the baseline score is the lighter bar and you get the uh, post score is the darker bar. So you're seeing this change in the score. It's getting better. It's remarkably better in some of these cases. So you know it works. But this creates, again, a philosophical problem of kind of what we know about science, right? And the kind of philosophy of science. So if you're a, one of those people who really only wants to know the primary outcome of a trial, if you think every secondary outcome is hypothesis generating, it's not really you know, being proven, et cetera. What these validation trials proved wasn't that, um, you know, PCI makes the score better. Right? That really wasn't what they were trying to, to find, right? They were validating it the other way. So basically what this proves is scores get better when you get a PCI, which is fine. Except we're now using it 30 years later to try and prove things the opposite way. We're trying to now take the same survey, give it to people who received a PCI, and of course their scores are going to get better. That's how it was validated. We know that it's its own internal fact. But now we're going to try and take this information and compare it to other things. And this is, again, this is kind of an intrinsic problem, right? So we've now found this circular logical situation here. We're going to try and use that to evaluate you know, the success of a therapy. It's not really the most intellectually honest thing to do. Here is the kind of narrowed down um, questions. They took the Seattle Angela questionnaire from 19 questions and narrowed it down to these. And you'll see they eliminated, they eliminated a lot of the finer points. Now we just wanna know about walking on level ground, gardening or vacuuming. So your patient who had uh, you know, angina just when they climb up that tall hill, they're not even gonna have a box on here to check. So although it eliminates a lot of those things that other patients maybe weren't really doing, for some of our patients, it really makes it not a usable piece of information. I can't give it to that patient and say, okay, well, you didn't check any of these boxes. How much better can I expect you to really feel? I can't use this, right? The other thing is some of the questions are a little bit still, um, you know, repetitive. Uh, it's like questions two and three, or some of them still really continue to be outside of how the angina it, itself may be occurring. So question number five, if you had to spend the rest of your life with chest pain, the way it is right now, how would you feel about this, right? Again, some patients may feel more satisfied with it than others. This is a question about what they consider to be good. And they may say, feeling it once in a while is okay. Feeling it ever is not okay, right? That's gonna be a big gap. And again, we need to understand kind of what it is for the patient, but in the survey form, it's not really what it's doing. It's just kind of neutering it into something that we can try and study. So for these patients in the ischemia, kind of side trial, they gave them the survey, and then here are the results. I think it's actually great that the way that they spread this out between patients with no angina, you'd ask, why are they even in the trial? And then patients who have daily or weekly angina. 
And you'll see at 48 months, these are the points difference on the actual um, survey that occur. And you'll see that there are some significant changes. Now for no angina, it's very small, um, but for daily or weekly angina, it's 5.6 points. Overall, again, if you only believe in the kind of headline outcome, we're stuck with the overall group, 3.1 points, all right? But what is a point? Well, going back to the survey, it didn't have that many questions. And so in the domain score, that's telling you how much each question affects the score internal to that kind of subdomain of questions, which isn't really important for us today. But what is really important is the summary score. That's the five points we're talking about. And if you look at the bottom line there, you'll see that each dot represents how much change there is in points relative to moving over one of those question boxes, right? So in the case of the quality of life domains, moving over one box in items four or five gets you almost five points. It looks like maybe around four, 4.5 points from moving one box. That's not a big difference, right? Up in the higher, uh, up higher on the chart, we talked about physical limitations, moving it over two boxes. Again, this is the one that really asks about when you experience your angina, clearly over five points, right? Just two boxes. So we're just not really seeing that significant of a change for something that seems really intuitive, right? When I give people PCIs, when, when, not when I give them, but when I send them to someone else to give them a PCI, they feel a lot better. And their angina seems to be gone. I'd expect all these things to shift the other side, but they don't. And so now we time to come back to this. So you, I, you know, I look to this to say, how could I practice with this in mind? But no one really practices in this way anyway, right? No one practices in such a data aggressively way such that I don't have patients come in and have them fill out the Seattle angina questionnaire every time I see them. And then if they're still having angina, I don't sit down and say, well, based on the frequency of your angina and based on this trial, I would expect you to see a two box improvement in your angina if we, you know, if we proceeded along with this procedure or this medicine, et cetera. We don't really practice in such a data aggressive way. What, what do we probably do? Well, what we probably do is we allow it to fulfill this kind of second mandate, right? We say, well, it makes people feel better. That's again, the headline result here is it statistically significantly makes people feel better. And then it validates what we already know or what we wanna know or how we want it to kind of fit in. And that is a really interesting, again, kind of philosophical question because now I'm not really being so true to the data and so if I'm going to hold myself as a physician, as someone who's different from other kind of maybe practitioners of making people feel better or taking care of their health, but I'm not really practicing in a way that's true to the, true to the science, what am I doing? Right? And I think that's the kind of the shift in gears here to talk about the second half of this talk. And that is, how does this really explain maybe what I think I'm doing, right? And then what I'm actually doing. And then how does that really fit into what I owe it to the patient? And how do we teach people about how to jive these, these conflicts, right? Because obviously this is a conflict we just, just kind of talked about. There's, there's some tension here between how I'm going to practice and kind of how I think I know things and how I'm supposed to change another person's life because of it. There's obviously going to be some kind of interaction here. And we do, we talk about this with uh, medical students. We talk about it in these kind of um, continuing medical education, you know, structures. And it's a really big part of what we think we do in medicine, right? There's ideas of uh, ethics or what we owe to patients that date back a very long time. And it's kind of a, a focus of pride, right? You go back to things like the Hippocratic Oath. These were obviously concepts uh, that existed throughout the Middle Ages as well. And then in the early 19th century, as a kind of moral philosophy is starting to expand in its own independent way, you get the creation of this independent idea of medical ethics. And medical ethics includes a whole lot of kind of fringe portions like professionalism, right? Or a particular duty that we have to patients that's going to be different than a duty that you have to other people, right? So this is your kind of fiduciary duty type of concept. This is going to get merged into a, a larger question called medical ethics. Medical ethics also has a kind of political power to it, right? A kind of self-regulation of professionalism. That's something we talk about professionals doing, right? Well, they, they self-regulate between themselves because of their great understanding of what they do. 
again, there has to be some kind of underlying concept that makes that acceptable in a way that we don't let other groups do the same thing. So this kind of comes from this medical ethics and groups really like this. And uh, all over the world, you see um, groups kind of glom onto this idea for various reasons. So the American Medical Association, they come up with their own code of ethics, the first one in 1847, they revise it all the time. And they pretty much take uh, Thomas Percival's ideas here in their own code of ethics, but they're also using it to defend medicine from other kinds of practitioners, right? What is it that makes a physician different from these other people who say that they're helping people feel better, right? We're defining it and it has a, a whole different uh, kind of philosophy that surrounds it. But this is actually not uh, very popular with a lot of people, particularly in the United States before the late 19th century. And that's because these concepts of creating its own internal philosophy that would um, like medical ethics or things like moral philosophy, this doesn't drive with a lot of people's base beliefs. Now, still true in the world, but certainly in America at that time, um, which was a particularly religious place, even relative to the European academic community, significantly more uh, religiously focused. And so Benjamin Rush, who uh, was one of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence, was teaching at uh, Penn to medical students uh, in the early 1800s. And there's a quote from him that says he doesn't he didn't like the idea that they were even teaching moral philosophy to medical students because moral philosophy is bad, right? Moral philosophy, trying to make some kind of ethics that stands outside of religion was a bad thing to him because religion was, was prime, right? Religion was primacy. The ethic or the morals came from on high. And for you to say that you came up with your own internal ethics of whatever kind, you know, this was an affront to God. Right? He's the guy that makes the rules. What do, you, what do you think you're doing? And this was really not an uncommonly held, as I said, belief throughout America, particularly at a time when uh, physicians weren't, uh, as a, uh, the American academic system was still very religious, and physicians even weren't really that academic at that time, right, in terms of what they were doing. So there was a lot of um, conflict here, and this didn't get resolved in a significant way um, for, again, a rather long time. In 1979, these two, um, these two guys, Tom Beauchamp and James Childress, publish this book called The Principles of Bioethics, which introduces these four principles that we all teach medical students and we all know now. Um, but they're really, it's not that old of a concept. And these four principles, autonomy, beneficence, non-malevolence, and justice, they come up with this system by kind of looking at a history of Western culture, kind of looking at things that are held as uh, being important in general. They come up with these ideas. And then they structure them together to try and create a web. So and a really important tenant of this principalism of these four principles is no single principle is more important than the other one. There's all a kind of give and take to them. But there's a real big uh, kind of issue or challenge. Um, sorry, there's a big issue or challenge to this kind of formation of principalism. And that is, as I said, it didn't come from something deeply underlying it. And so what people are supposed to do is they're supposed to just take this school of thought and kind of place it on top of the other stuff you already think, right? And the other stuff you already think, as I we talked about at the start, it informs all kinds of things. What is a good day, right? What is good art? What are these things that are good? Well, now you have to take these other things and you kind of just have to assume, we well, have to go, autonomy is good, beneficence is good, justice is good. And again, I think on the surface, you'd say, well, yeah, those things are good. That, that kind of jives with what I believe. But there are actually a lot of pretty significant conflicts between some of these issues, right? Um, for example, if you uh, you know have a, a strong belief in the the power of work, right? The kind of American history of the Protestant work ethic. If you think work is inherently good, and it's a good thing for people to do, that's going to influence how you're going to view what your patient may want to do. Well, maybe they're too short of breath. They're telling me they can't work. It's important for them to work. I want them to be able to do that. The patient may not feel that way, right? And the system is supposed to tell you, look, you need to respect their autonomy, right? That's what the principles here are supposed to do to go, I don't really care. You know, the system doesn't really care if you have this external belief that work is good because the patient is this autonomous person. But again, if you're of a particular religious background, you may say, well, but no, right? And like, I'm taught that uh, it's very good to help change people 
um, to make them fit into this thing because this is important. It's important to value work or it's important to um, you know, convert people, et cetera. And so there are definitely these border points where there's a lot of conflict between what you're maybe doing in the other parts of your life or the way you're thinking about other things in life and then what you have to do in order to be a professional and fit into the professional ethics. From a structural standpoint, this is good for the system, right? The system um, wants us to ignore those things when we come to the table because we do need a meaningful way to discuss things like organ allocation without really getting into um, you know, judgmental concepts about alcohol consumption, right? If this is a moral discussion about that, that's gonna be a very cloudy picture as opposed to maybe some other considerations of what that person should or should not be allowed to do. So we wanna live in this kind of bubble. But as I said, it's going to create some real kind of interference at the at the sides. The AMA has continued to update their code of ethics, uh, the original one from 1847, as I was saying, and they have all kinds of statements in theirs as well, which are even more uh, kind of layered than the original principles from the principles of bioethics, though they expect you to use them in the same way. So same thing, if you're looking to more of this, how are we educating people? What are we telling ourselves we're supposed to be doing? They have guidelines, uh, really true principles, like a physician shall be dedicated to providing competent medical care. That seems okay. I don't think any of us are going to disagree with that. We should have respect for dignity and human rights. Okay, I agree with that. But again, if you really want to dig into individuals' philosophies, our views about what rights are, are going to be really different for some people. Certainly our views about what it is to be dedicated and the extent to which an individual is dedicated. You see this again in uh, point number six that they make. A physician shall, in uh, provision, so in the provision of appropriate patient care, except in emergencies. We all just live through a public health emergency. I think a lot of us would have varying opinions on what it is to be an emergency, and the extent to which, when you're in an emergency, certain things should be compelled of individuals, or kind of what that expectation is, or who's deciding it's an emergency. But structurally, we have to create this this you know way of describing it. And the problem is, as you can see, as they try and layer more ideas rather than just justice or non-maleficence, when you add these layers to it, now there's a lot more that you may kind of come into individual uh, conflict with. And then finally, this last point, a physician shall support access to medical care for all people. Again, a great political motivator from the, uh, the AMA. It certainly falls in line with what they want to do. Um, and you can, again, see like, well, look, it's coming from our principles. This is a core idea to us. But that's a pretty kind of wide ranging amount of opinions among physicians. What is it to allow them to have access? Does access mean it's free? Does access just mean no one's being denied it entirely? How am I providing that access? That's a really big kind of question here. Very challenging for that to be an underlying principle of everything we're going to do when it itself is going to have a lot of underlying questions. And as you can see, the real issue with all of these is none of them have any grounding. And that's on purpose, because if they had grounding, then you're going to definitely come into more conflict with them. So if they had grounding that was very clear about, um, you know, the autonomy of patients, as it has to do with body autonomy um, and reproductive care, that's going to come in direct conflict with a lot of the things that some people are going to come to the table with in medicine. And so they can't do it, right? They try, they have to try and give you some other sort of structure where you're going to have to ignore some things in order to make it work. And I think what's really challenging about this is that in doing it by design, if we don't dig too deep into it, it's fine, it works, you can just kind of use it, but it becomes really challenging when people start to encounter these issues on the fringes. And it also becomes challenging when it comes time to try and understand our patients, because our patients aren't acting in a world of principalism, right? Principalism is a construct that we made up to let us practice medicine in a particular way, but what they're bringing to the table is, in America, most likely a moral uh, education that comes from a religious background or religious cultural background. That's by far the most um, significant contributor to how Americans think about their ethical and, and uh, moral fabric. They generally identify coming from their faith. So that's a very important thing to them. And we're trying to, again, make them inhabit this world of principalism. These things aren't really going to jive in a significant way. Now, where do we kind of where do we go from here? And how does this even apply to these kind of small fringe cases that I was talking about? Part of it has to come with how we think about what we do, right? Are physicians real 
scientists. Is it okay that I'm not talking to patients about the data in a strict sense because maybe I'm not, right? And I'm, I'm allowed to practice in this way of whatever principalism will let me be as a physician where maybe that is not a real scientist, a, a kind of true to the data scientist. Also, how do we drive concepts of what we know to patients, right? Um, in teaching first year medical students, you know, we talk a lot about the shift um, in what it is to be significant, right? All of a sudden we use significant in this really formal way in medicine all the time, but colloquially, obviously it has a whole you know, different range of what it means. When we talk to our patients, they are not gonna come in with nearly the same approach to what it is to be significant or significantly important. If you have a patient who's really, uh, you know, wants something to make them feel better, they may feel really content with something that had a lower p value, right? Something that you'd say, well, that, you know, it could have been random chance that these things made patients feel better. And they go, look, I've tried everything, right? I'm I'm willing to do these other things, right? And again, practitioners who aren't, uh, who don't view themselves as as scientists, um, who may be in kind of some other fields, they're going to be okay with that because it may make the patient feel better, right? How okay are we going to be with that? Even if it really does make the patient feel better. And there is some kind of basis to it, right? Physiologic understanding, et cetera. But now we're having to deviate from this concept of, of what we're doing as a true scientist and relying, relying only on data. This also brings into um, you know, some questions about how we talk to this to trainees. Um, I think honestly, questions of like the, the placebo problem are a really a uh, good way to introduce this, the kind of limitations to say, if you look at the principles of uh, biomedical ethics and principalism, we can't just give placebo therapy to patients and say, look, this works, right? And then make them feel better. And they fill out a survey and they say it works and we go, then we should just give them placebos because it violates these ideas of um, you know, justice to the patient. The patient's an independent person. They deserve to know what we're doing to them. But again, if I'm not sitting down and saying, well, okay, if you take spironolactone, you may see a one box improvement on this scale, et cetera, et cetera. Am I being that much more dishonest about it because I'm not being, I'm not giving them the full disclosure, right? I'm just saying it will make you feel better based on the data or the research, right? If I'm not really describing to them in depth or helping them understand in depth what that means, am I being as honest as I, as I hold myself to be or that I think I should be? And there are people, again, based on their philosophical school or opinion, who may say, placebo problem isn't a problem. They may say, I'm a utilitarian. It makes people feel better. What's the difference, right? What's the, the kind of range here? And again, integrating these things at, at the borders, I think is gonna be really helpful for students in understanding, you know, these tools that we're giving you are tools, it's just like everything else to get the job done. They're not gonna really give you personal relief or understanding of everything, you know, that you're doing or that we do as a field. And so in, in kind of final point, uh, to return to that question number 11, how often do you worry that you may have a heart attack or die suddenly? That's a really stressful problem for a patient to have. Certainly would think that if there was something I could do to make them feel better, that that would be a net good thing. Um, if you had a patient that came in, again, from a cardiology standpoint, who's a 45-year-old who goes, I'm terrified I'm going to have a heart attack all the time. And they, I run marathons. I feel fine. No one in my family has heart disease. I'm clicking, but I'm very worried about having a heart attack. Right? And all that our research data would say, don't do anything for this person. They don't have any symptoms. There's really nothing great to do here. But you could give them a coronary CTA and prove they have no coronary disease and that person may sleep like a baby. Also, because I'm gonna explain this, you have no coronary disease, right? Likelihood is very low. I've done a net good for that person, but that's really not how we should be practicing because maybe I didn't, I gave them a little bit of radiation. There's some limit to it, but it does make the patient feel better. But there's definitely a limit to the extent to which we're going to do it. And when we, when we do that, we have to focus to say, too, that we're not doing everything we can to make patients feel better. And that's okay, because there's some kind of limitation to it. But again, how do we jive at the end of the day to say, I did a net good for that person, or maybe I didn't, but that's okay. So that, that's, that's what I have. Thank you, Dr. DeVito, an excellent talk. No, thank you, Dr. Hamlin. Well, we have a good chunk of time. Um, any questions for Dr. Akaviri? Well, while we wait, 
Um, I would love to hear your thoughts about the role of implicit bias in making ethical decisions in medicine. Yeah, I mean, I think that the um, implicit bias that we come in with, right, like the underlying philosophy that we all have, it's just overwhelming. And that's why these concepts like principalism um, have some kind of benefit, or at least this is the theory, right? So if I can put on top of some structure that you're going to have to assume, you're going to come to work with your implicit bias, but now you're going to have to get into this principalism framework, this paradigm that hopefully you can try and, you know, kind of eliminate it or restructure it. I think the problem is you can't really do that, right? I mean, you still come in and what you're bringing to the table, because we don't talk about how these two things don't fit together, people are trying to do it. So they're trying to say, well, maybe I have this feeling or this implicit bias, but I'm supposed to acknowledge, you know, their, uh, the other person's personhood, right? Or, or um, their individuality and their, uh, their right to make their own decisions. There's still going to be a limit to that, right? There's going to be a limit to which someone's going to say, I'm not really comfortable with where that line is, because in my eye, you don't have that much autonomy. You shouldn't be able to make that decision. And other people aren't going to have that same feeling. So even interacting with a structure that's supposed to provide us a way of getting away from that bias, you still bring it in, you know, you still bring it inside of that. And I think that's a real, um, it's a real challenge that this doesn't fix, right? In not acknowledging it and saying, let's all just sit down at the table and assume the same things, that actually doesn't fix the problem because these are some really deeply kind of emotional more you know, significant problems and you can just ignore in the same way that you may be able to just ignore structurally other things like for the sake of a particular you know, piece of research, right? You say, well, I'm just gonna ignore that I think PCIs work and I'm gonna really focus on this trial and I'm gonna try and work around that, right? Even that's hard to do. But if you're gonna step back and say, I'm gonna ignore that I think, you know, personhood begins at some stage in con after conception, I'm just gonna ignore that. That's almost impossible for you to really ignore. Right. I mean, for people to really separate themselves entirely from fundamental beliefs from themselves and kind of come into a space and do that, that's really challenging because there's all these other things that that belief touches and shapes. And you can't really get around all that. Thank you. Dr. Schnapp. Yes. So thank you, Michael, for a, a, a nice overview. So if you were going to summarize, uh, you know, give me one sentence of what you, a, a take home point that you want the attendees to leave with what how what would you say yeah that's hard that's really hard I, uh, that's what i'm asking you to do it <laughs> i would say um when you're making uh, ask yourself when you're making a patient feel better uh, or when you think you're about to make a patient feel better who's better are you using Okay. I would say that's kind of the best summary of it, right? Um, and a, yeah. a, a second question, just in reference to your your the last example in terms of um, providing a cardiac uh, CT for someone who's worried about um, having a heart attack, even though they are very low risk. So how do you balance the the needs of making that patient feel better? versus contributing to the increased healthcare cost um, for, for society, as well as the potential for finding an incidental finding, which then is going to lead you down another rabbit hole. So yeah. no, that's again, that's a that's an excellent question. So again, this is where this is where principalism is going to, to ultimately fail us because the principalism structure was put into place to give us a wide lane. And I, I to I would I would liken it in some ways to things like um, guidelines, right? So guidelines that we have, for example, in cardiology, they give us a pretty wide berth for what we're allowed to do, right? For this person, maybe you could PCI. For this person, you could medical therapy. They're both acceptable, right? And it, it does that in order to avoid conflict. And so in principalism, it's going to intentionally create this kind of more vacuous space. But how do you weigh, um, how do you weigh the right of a student in your school district to get a lunch if that uh, you know, money is coming instead to pay for a patient's CT scan. That's a very weird way to think about that. Um, and what people would say in philosophy, and, and actually when I started studying philosophy, this was a big hangup that I had because I, I kind of took the world as this construct as it was. And I'd say 
that exact phrase. I'd say like, well, we can't just um, treat everyone's everything because you have to pay nurses and you have to do this and et cetera. And the reality is from a philosophical perspective, a kind of a larger worldview perspective, you could craft a world in which our priorities are entirely different. And we could say, we are a health centric philosophy world. And we are not going to let people smoke because it's bad for them. And we're going to, you know, reduce their rights in some ways to expand their rights in other ways. And that's going to be the existence that we're going to have. The challenge is that that requires a really different paradigm, right? The whole world has to get on board to say, nurses, uh, we need to train more nurses and we need less salesmen. We're not going to sell people things, right? That's how we're going to fix this. The whole society is going to come around it. Our challenge is we don't live in that society, right? We live in a kind of free market capitalist society, which is going to have its own kind of anchoring problems. And so in, in some about this to say, the, the challenge is we've been given a structure in principalism that is not going to answer that question because it needs to allow for the fact that we're not coming in with those opinions similarly. Someone who's a true blue capitalist is going to say, not good, right? That's like, we don't want to do that because uh, unless... That's uh, something that person's going to pay for on their own because that could be a free market principle. Someone who has a you know a more strict socialist perspective on it may say, if it's something we can't give to everybody, you shouldn't be able to provide that right. So again, the thing that we come to the table with, we have to try and ignore for the sake of how we consider it. And when we can't jive those, it becomes impossible to really answer those questions. So, so as a pragmatic person, what are you going to do when yeah. the 35-year-old marathon runner says, I want a, you know, understand my risk for heart. Are you for, mm -hmm. for a heart attack? Are you going to order that cardiac CT or are you going to um, spend the time and reassure them? So I would say that I, uh, I do the latter. So, you know, that's my, that's my kind of personal philosophy, right? I take the time and I try and explain it to them. Um, but that's not what we all do. And, you know, there are plenty of, of um, there are plenty of even structural things such as um, you know, preventative type of clinics or establishment, you know, kind of structurally, where we give more intensive resources to the people who show up for it, right? As opposed to applying those resources as broadly across all people. So even that kind of construct that we make that available, again, is a telling part about how we prioritize things as a society. Is it because it generates revenue? Is it because it does provide those people psychological relief? Hard to, you know, hard to encapsulate all those pieces. But we don't mandate that those resources are spread all evenly. We do allow for, you know, clustering, which again has some underlying structure to it. Why do we do that? Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have we have a couple of questions, Michael. <clears throat> First one is, uh, what are your thoughts about physicians treating themselves? I that's actually I have not really thought about that um, in this respect. Um, I really haven't contemplated that before. I, I think that um, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, honestly, I'm like a little bit stumped by that. I wasn't expecting that to be kind of a part of this. I, I would say that when you're kind of treating yourself, right? In theory, you'd have the best understanding, kind of, of what you'd want. Um, but again, like as we know, why we're not supposed to do it, right? Is you're going to maybe consider yourself as as differently from someone else. So maybe would order something or do something that you really shouldn't do. I think that there's a lot of psychological kind of games that you can play with that, right? Like there are certainly people who I think would treat themselves differently um, in a negative way. They would do less because they were going to hold themselves to some standard to say like, I wouldn't do this. You know, this is what a good doctor is. But ultimately, um, I think it actually betrays the, the real uh, kind of point of what we're doing as doctors. We're treating ourselves all the time with our knowledge of being doctors, right? So the fact that I'm a cardiologist and I read research about vegan diets and the contribution of uh, animal proteins to the formation of coronary artery disease, I'm certainly much more sensitive to eating meat, right? Is that because I sent myself to a dietitian to do it? No, but I'm still exposed to my own knowledge and how that forms my life. I do much more probably activity than I would otherwise because I know the benefits of activity. So I'm kind of all the time treating myself with my knowledge. The question kind of becomes at the fringes when I have to involve other people or involve other parts of the system. You know, is it right for me to make those decisions unilaterally to say, I'm ordering a CT scan or I'm, you know, I need this kind of procedure done. But that doesn't mean that kind of through your entire life, you're not making these kind of micro decisions to say, you know, this is something that I, 
is a good thing for me to do for my health because I know that, which is just knowledge that other kind of people don't have. So I'd say that's that would be my perspective on it would be to say we're doing it all the time, right, in smaller ways. Some of our knowledge may not be as widely applicable. So if you're a person with great solid tumor knowledge, you may never really be applying that to yourself, but you still have all of that other underlying medical knowledge that you're probably using on yourself or your family or your kids when they get a scratch or et cetera, that it really isn't available to other people. And I don't really think that there's anything wrong with doing that. I don't think it's wrong um, you know, to clean your kids cut out, right? Rather than someone else that may be worried and take that patient to a doctor because you know that that's an okay thing to do. Um, so I would say in that sense, unless, unless it's involving kind of the larger system and you're asking a burden of it, we're kind of doing it anyway. We have another question about palliative care. <laughs> and the question is, uh, this approach seems to help with complicated patients with many physical symptoms. How does this align with your contentions? Um, so again, I think that the, um, the you know, palliative care is a, is a probably like the most intersectional point, which is why it gets talked about so much, right? Like end of life care, end of life care is a huge budding point between the principles, which are supposed to give a lot of power to patient autonomy. And there has to be some kind of balance here and the other stakeholders in that patient's care. And then personal beliefs that patients or like that, that persons may come in uh, to the table with, right? And so palliative care, that's why it's kind of been such a focus of medical ethics. It's like probably what we associate it with most prominently. If you're calling an ethics consult, it's probably for an end-of-life patient. And, you know, the conflict here is basically the doctor thinks that you're not going to survive and the, you know, family thinks that it's worth resources or vice versa. The patient would really like to um, end their life, but, you know, does society, larger society, allow that to happen? You know, those conflicts, they just are going to happen at that at that barrier, and that's really the that's a great failing point of principalism, right? Because principalism is going to try and make you adhere to one structure to say I have to respect the patient's autonomy, but if the patient says give me a you know a ton of uh, fentanyl and just do me, then you're like that I can't do that, right? There's some limit to it, but that's a that's a huge intersectional point between those two those two pieces. How are you going to drive that, and what makes you really a stakeholder in that patient's life? You have a relationship with that patient, so you have a duty to them, but the patient could say, nah, I'm going to go see another doctor in another jurisdiction who can do this. It's not like you then owe it to them to chase them down to say, no, 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 you shouldn't do this because I think it's a moral right, right? The patient has the ability to separate themselves from you to make this medical choice. So I think that the intersectionality of palliative care is actually probably the most frequent issue here. Kind of the reason I didn't talk about it so much is because I think it comes up so much more frequently because um, I think it's just an inherent problem. Excellent. Let's see, we have one more decision. Uh, how do you think about decision making when patients may have limited ability to thoroughly understand the options? Yeah. So, again, a really kind of fascinating uh, you know, limitation here. Um, I get a lot of patients too who I think could understand what I'm trying to explain to them, but they really want me to tell them what to do, right? Um, and this again, kind of runs amok of principalism. I'm not supposed to paternalistically make a decision for the patient, but all the time I get patients who think they're going to trick me into telling them what I would do for my mom, right? I get this all the time. Like, well, if it was your mom, right, what would you do for her? And I tell them, you know, my mom has made it very clear to me since I was a kid, even before I was a doctor, what she thinks about life, right? So I, I have that knowledge and that's how I would inform that decision. But I don't know your this person, right? I mean, I, I don't know you to make that decision. And so in those cases where it's either an expectation they have that you're going to act in a more paternalistic way, again, that comes to heads with what we're telling students, what we're telling each other in these principles, you shouldn't be doing. You shouldn't be acting paternalistically. You need to step back and just let the patient make that decision. It's challenging in the example that you're giving here to say, well, I recognize you maybe can't, right? So now I recognize you can't. And again, in the principalistic standpoint, they would say, then it's okay to be more paternalistic because someone's going to have to make the decision and, and you know, right? That would be the argument kind of internal to paternalism. But actually, again, from the outside, there are people who would be more strict individualists who would say, look, then you need to find someone who knows you, right? We've got to get your son involved or your nephew involved or whatever. 
And there would be other people who are fine with more paternalism who would say, okay, then I would just get the procedure. I think you should do it. And when we're living it, we don't really consider it that quickly, right? They just say like, well, what would you do? And you look at them and they go, they don't really know what's going on. And you go, I would do this because I think it's going to be what's best for you, right? But that's what you're bringing to the table with really out noticing it. Like, this is that kind of implicit bias, whereas other people may hem and haw about that problem, you know, and ultimately, you know, try and find some other way around it. But that's the implicit thing that we're bringing in from outside. All right. Well, Dr. Akavidi, that was a very, very interesting topic. I enjoyed it listening to you and I'm sure the audience did the same. So thank you very much again for the excellent presentation and thank you all for joining us and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank okay. you again. Take care. It was enjoyable. Thank you very much.